So yeah, hi, I'm Derek Kawamoto. Um, I'm from Hawkeye 360. Uh, we've got a booth over there. Come check us out. We can talk and uh, whatnot. Um, I also am a part-time student at the Hume Center in Virginia Tech. Um, I've been a, a PhD student for a long time. Uh, if you asked me four years ago when I thought I'd finish, you know, I, I'd say two years. And so if you ask me today, I'm maybe about two years out. So uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about rigorous moment-based automatic modulation classification. Now, hopefully this isn't. Uh, hopefully I don't put anyone to sleep too badly. Uh, if you want to get up and get some coffee, just go for it. Um, I won't be offended. So um, today uh, we'll just kind of introduce the AMC problem. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit uh, when Dr. Clancy was here, uh, but basically we want to discern the modulation of a transmitted signal. Um, this is very important for cognitive radio kind of things or uh, spectrum awareness, as you as you know. Um, if you're trying to get into the classification algorithm development or research, um, there's a couple references uh, that I have at the end of the slides, and um, all of this is written up in the technical proceedings. Uh, so at the end, there's a, a nice reference list that you can kind of go through to, to get up to speed uh, in what's going on. So I guess there's two goals of this purpose, uh, of this, uh, this talk. Uh, the first is to introduce this concept of orthogonal polynomials uh, to signal processing. Um, Orthogonal polynomials is something that's been done in physics, quantum physics, for a long time now. And uh, probably the more recent prolific use of orthogonal polynomials has been in finance. Uh, when there's a lot of money on the line, there's a lot of people doing really hard math. So, uh, And then secondly, I just want to show some new results related to this, this moment-based modulation recognition. So uh, we'll try to keep moving along. Um, and so the, the idea of this kind of modulation recognition is that we treat all of our receiver symbols, post receiver symbols, so that means it's time synchronized, frequency synchronized, and phase offset has been corrected, right? Uh, we'll treat all of these symbols as an IID random variable. And so you can do statistics on this. You can calculate the average value, the variance, and whatnot. Um, and in 2000, Swami and Sadler came up with a uh, decision tree kind of thing. Uh, which operated on what are called cumulants. And so cumulants are very much related to the moments. Uh, you see a bunch of them listed here. The first three, the cumulants and the moments, are the same. So you got the, the kappas are the cumulants. Uh, the first one is equal to the mean. Second one is equal to the variance. Third one equal to, the, I guess, that skew. Uh, when you get to the fourth cumulant and above, they start getting a little bit crazier. Uh, and so cumulus also exists for complex random variables, which is kind of where we live with our I and Q symbols, right? Uh, it gets a little bit complicated. We're not going to be talking too much about cumulus. It just is an introduction to the moment-based stuff. Uh, so we're just going to gloss over that if that's OK. Um, so basically, the idea is that the cumulus of a signal constellation, for example, BPSK, where you have two symbols, right, one and zero, or QPSK, where you have four, um, you can calculate the cumulants of these signal constellations. Um, these statistical cumulants are great because uh, the cumulants of AWGN, Gaussian noise, are all zero except for the, the variance, the second cumulant. And so what that means is that you can add the two together, your signal plus your noise, and the cumulants besides the second one are all untouched. And so that was kind of the motivating factor for using uh, cumulants in the Swami and Sadler paper. Um, the empirical cumulants, what you do is you get a, a bunch of input symbols. You can estimate the cumulants and uh, compare them to these statistical ones, what you expect. And uh, you, based on some decision criterion, you can figure out what modulation the signal was. And so in the paper, uh, the Sa Swami and Sadler paper, uh, there is a four-class problem where you have four ASK, four amplitude shift keying, uh, BPSK, 8PSK, 16 QAM. Um, and if you calculate this fourth-order cumulant, you look at the magnitude, and you can kind of determine which modulation the signal came from. Uh, so there were two kinds of things I was thinking about as, a, as I was uh, looking into cumulant-based uh, modulation classification. Um, the first is estimation error. So basically, we have these statistical cumulants, and in the ideal world, the AWGN adds zero uh, amount of cumulant to our third orders and above. Uh, but in the real world, we have this estimation error, right? Um, 
basically the cumulants, just because they should be zero if you have an infinite amount of data, uh, because we have a finite amount of data, they add some error in there. And so if you were to think of the statistical cumulants as like a point in some space, the empirical cumulants that we measure uh, form some space around these points, right? Uh, secondly, when we start to estimate or figure out, classify based on lower and lower amounts of data, uh, we have what I like to call the uneven prior problem. And so if you imagine you have a uh, 32 symbols to do a classification decision on, but if 16 quam is one of your, your uh, modulations that you're trying to choose from, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to get two samples drawn from every symbol of your 16 quam. And so what this does is it's going to throw around the cumulants and uh, just make that space of empirical cumulants even bigger. And so there's all this error involved. And so rather than having these static decision regions, uh, what I propose is that we should try to incorporate these things into our classifier models. And so basically, the idea is that we're going to train a classifier uh, where each model is tuned to a specific SNR and a specific data input length. What that does is it, it gives us an idea of the space of empirical moments or cumulants around what statistically it should be. Um, and basically, we're capturing these two problems in a bunch of training data. And so, uh, for a bunch of reasons, we're going to shift away from cumulants and move to moments. Um, and that's kind of the gist of what's going on in this paper. Now, if we stopped right there, this would be a machine learning uh, paper. It'd be great. But this is rigorous moment-based automatic modulation classification. So uh, we're going to start diving into a little bit of math. And uh, you know, if you don't like this kind of stuff, go get your coffee. You know, again, not going to be uh, offended. Uh, but we're going to analyze and improve the moment-based uh, methods here uh, using the idea of orthogonal polynomials. Um, before we get to that, I think there's two novel contributions that we can speak of uh, when we talk about this, this work. Um, the first is just application of orthogonal polynomials, which is well established in other fields, uh, to signal processing, to modulation recognition. Um, basically, we're going to take moments over input signal, if you remember the, the symbols I and Q symbols, we'll take the moments of that. Um, and we're going to estimate a probability density function from them. Um, if you're statistics savvy, this is called gram charlier approximation. Um, there's all kinds of pros and cons to this method. I'm sorry, what? Uh, is it using the moment generating function? The gram charlier approximation is very much related to the moment generating function and to the characteristic functions, right? Um, Mm, I'd have to think about it, but uh, yeah, we should talk later. We can uh, exchange ideas. Um, this analysis, um, it transformed yeah, these I and Q symbols into essentially a Euclidean space, and that's kind of where all the excitement is. Uh, we transform these I and Q symbols into a nice structured space, and then we can apply our favorite machine learning algorithms on it. Um, and so in this Euclidean space, we can calculate the distance between two PDFs uh, and do a lot of cool things. Uh, secondly, as we do this, I think this connection between moment-based automatic modulation classification and probability distribution-based automatic modulation classification, I think that link is new. Uh, and while it's not important to the performance of what's going on, I, I think it's just it's cool, right? So uh, I apologize if I get excited and you're not excited. So we'll see. <laughs> um, so yeah. The, the problem of mapping a bunch of moments to a probability density function is called the moment problem. Uh, depending on which domain you're on, there are different names. One of them is called the hamburger moment problem. Uh, it's kind of my favorite just because, you know, you know, there's a joke in there somewhere, right? Um, on the real line and the complex plane, um, there are certain conditions for convergence or for identifiability, uniqueness, and whatnot we, beyond the scope of this talk, right? But what's important to know is that if you have a linear modulation like BPSK, QPSK, any kind of QAM, uh, when you add Gaussian noise to it, um, these PDFs live in the space which are representable uh, by this technique that we're going to use, by gram charlier uh, We're going to let Z equal these complex symbols, I and Q symbols. Again, post receiver, right? Um, which is kind of a, a simplification, but you know, hopefully in future work we can kind of bring it back out and address 
so, uh, certain parameters, nuisance parameters. Um, and then we'll let f of z be the PDF. And we're going to gram Charlie all of this, all the things. Uh, so hopefully we're going to spend only about five minutes talking about gram Charlie orthogonal polynomials. Um, what's going on here is that we're transforming a Gaussian PDF, and in our case, a complex Gaussian PDF, into the estimated probability density function corresponding to our signal constellation plus or noise uh, using a radon nicotine derivative. And so if you're a fan of real analysis, this might be familiar to you. If you're not a fan of real analysis, don't worry about it, right? Uh, equation two, is that right? Is uh, kind of what we're going towards. Um, is this a laser pointer? No, no, no. Well, I'll just walk over here. Oh. So um, kind of what we're seeing here is a series expansion thing going on. Um, uh, we have a, a summation over p's and q's. And then um, over here, we have Hermite polynomials and a, um, our complex Gaussian PDF. And these coefficients here, um, we're, we're basically series decomposing our radon nicotine uh, derivative into coefficients times basis functions. Uh, I might be rambling, so we're just going to keep going. Uh, so, so yeah, exactly. So this is very much related to Fourier analysis. Uh, it's kind of like a Fourier series. Instead of sines and cosines, we're using these Hermite polynomials with the complex Gaussian. Oh, hey, thanks, Ben. Hey, OK. Now I'm going to get distracted by this red dot. OK. So, uh, where do these complex Hermite polynomials come from? They're uh, related to the derivatives, partial derivatives, um, of the complex Gaussian. Um, the z is a complex number, right, x plus jy. And the z bar is a conjugate, x minus jy. Um, there's a reference, Dunkel and Shu. Great book on orthogonal polynomials. The first couple chapters kind of really informed a lot of this work. Um, and the first couple Hermite polynomials are just listed here. Um, there's a recursion formula. You can dig into it. Uh, And so one property of these Hermite polynomials is that they're orthogonal. So if you do an inner product on them, um, and it's defined with respect to a weight function, uh, the dot product, inner product, are only non-zero when the Hermite polynomials are identical, right? Uh, so if you do a dot product of two different Hermite polynomials, they cancel out. Uh, that's true in the complex domain as well. And this p factorial, q factorial thing going on here is a normalizing factor so that we can construct an orthonormal basis function. Zipping on along, uh, we kind of mentioned that you can think of it as a series expansion. You have your inner product here and a basis function h here. Um, the cool thing about this inner product is that because it's defined with respect to this weight function, it shows up here. And the fees, the complex Gaussian PDFs, disappear. And what you're left with is these coefficients, these inner products, are just the expectation of a polynomial. And when I got to this in my research, I was like, yeah, that, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Some of you might not agree with how cool this is, but I'm just going like, to sit here for a second, OK? Bob thought it was cool. He might be a little biased. It's OK. Um, so when we do all of this analysis, right, all of these functions, these PDFs that we're estimating, live in a, a Hilbert space, uh, which is really cool because Hilbert spaces come with a, a metric or a distance function on them, um, basically related to the inner products and absolute values, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so you can show that these Hermite polynomial coefficient things, these little h's, uh, can be used in computing the distance between two functions. And in this square root term here, we just have a simple Euclidean distance, right? So what that means is we had i and q symbols. We bring it into this moment kind of thing. And then we combine these moments in this linear combination of uh, this expected value of polynomials, right? Uh, and then we can use Euclidean distance to examine how close one set of i and q symbols were to another set of INQ symbols. Uh, so yeah, what that means is we have mapped INQ stuff into a nice Euclidean space. Um, 
because of this metric, because of this distance function, uh, it makes it really easy for us to apply whatever machine learning algorithms we want, right? Uh, you could use k-nearest neighbors, you could use deep neural networks, which is what we did. Uh, if we wrote this paper 10 years ago, we'd probably be using support vector machines or something like that, right? Uh, what we're going to use is the deep neural network as a discriminative classifier, um, which forms nonlinear decision regions in this Euclidean space. And so if you remember back, we had these statistical moments or statistical cumulants and a space around them due to the estimation error and uh, the uneven prior problem, right? We can start to capture the space around the statistical points uh, with this nonlinear decider, right? So we have a pretty picture. Here we go. Uh, what you're seeing here is a visualization of this Euclidean space. It's very high dimensional. Um, I think in my paper I went up to the eighth order of moments, which means I think there are 45 coefficients, uh, complex coefficients to compute. And when I project these down to two dimensions using the T-SNE projection, on the left you see a high SNR, 20 dB, uh, lots of data, 20, 48 symbols. Um, all of these INQ symbols were generated from these different modulations, mapped into these uh, coefficients, and projected down. You'll see that they're all very well separated. It's really nice, right? On the right-hand side, you'll see a low SNR, a lot less data kind of condition, 3 dB, uh, 128 symbols, I think. Um, and you'll see everything kind of starting to get close together. Um, in this projection, it doesn't look very encouraging, but um, in the higher dimensional space, even though a lot of these modulations kind of get really close, uh, they're still sort of separated, so not everything is doom and gloom. So we'll get to experiments and results. Right? Uh, we did a typical deep neural network kind of thing. Uh, this was my introduction to learning how to do machine learning. And so uh, not everything here is the best way to do things, but it's what worked. Um, I used TensorFlow with a backpropagation and a cross entropy cost function, pretty standard for classification uh, deep neural nets. Uh, the training data for each modulation were generated specific to the model, right? So you have a specific SNR and a specific amount of symbols that we're generating for this. Uh, in the experiments, we ranged from negative 10 to 20 dB in 1 dB increments. Uh, this is all supervised training, right? Uh, the hardest part about all of this for me as a newbie to machine learning was really figuring out how to train this deep neural network. And so kind of what I found out was that dropout regularization was great, uh, but I had to add some just noise to the inputs of the, uh, the, the training algorithm for the first couple hundred iterations. Uh, when I dug into it, what really was happening is that it was really helping the classifier to avoid overfitting. Uh, and so if you try to do something like this in the future, maybe this will help you out a little bit. Um, we compared the deep neural net classifier to a maximum likelihood method, the average likelihood ratio test, I think it's called. Um, and we also tried something silly where we took the complex coefficients and just took the magnitude, uh, toss out all the phase information and, and see what happens. Um, at first, I was hoping that this would help us deal with phase offsets in a constellation, but as I, I think about it more and more, I'm not convinced that that is the correct way to do things. Um, and so what we're going to see here are plots for uh, probability of correct classification for a seven-class modulation recognition problem and a four-class problem. So here, a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, hopefully you're not color challenged, but these green lines are always the top of these three sets of uh, plots. And the green lines correspond to the maximum likelihood method. So of course it's going to outperform the deep neural network uh, implementation, which is great. Because if my stuff did better, we'd, Bob and I would be talking, right? Um, the blue lines here are kind of the deep neural network implementation. And the red lines are for the magnitude only deep neural network. Uh, what we see is that, oh, and then also for the, the three sets of plots, they're uh, different amounts of data. So in one set, the, the best performing set, we have 512 symbols of data to do our classification on. In the next one, there's 128. And then in the bottom set of plots, there are 32 symbols. And so what we're seeing is that the deep neural network implementation using this gram charlier uh, method uh, performs to within a couple percent of maximum likelihood, or if you want to do it the other way, to within a, a fraction of a dB. Um, that was great. 
uh, I thought this was beautiful because moment-based uh, techniques have, have always kind of, in my mind, been subpar to maximum likelihood. There's always been difficulties, and so I think uh, this shows that we can close that gap for the simplified problem of post-receiver uh, modulation classification. Um, if you're not familiar with AMC problems, um, a lot of these incorrect classifications are because of confusion between a small set of modulations, right? So 8PSK looks a lot like QPSK and 16QAM when you're down at 3 dB of SNR. Um, when you look into any modulation recognition paper, you'll see that 8PSK gets commonly confused. Uh, for some reason, 32QAM does great, even uh, at this low SNR. If you have ideas on why that is, come talk to me. And then for the four-class problem, we have similar results. The uh, deep neural network performs almost as well as maximum likelihood. So a couple slides left. We'll get into to some questions or whatever. Um, basically, I'm excited because I think we've shown that moment-based AMC can perform almost as well as uh, maximum likelihood. Um, we did a rigorous formulation using all this math so that we're not just putting things into a, a deep neural network and just seeing what happens. Uh, it really gives us a way to explain what might be going on under the hood. Um, we address the problem of estimation error and the uneven prior problem by generating data which was uh, reflected those kinds of conditions. Um, and I think we did pretty well down at 32 symbols, which is a, a very interesting place for modulation recognition. Um, something to think about if you ever want to try to implement this is that these moments are very easily parallelizable to compute, um, either in FPG or GPU. Um, computation of the Gram-Charlier coefficients is a simple matrix multiply because it's a linear combination of these moments. And execution of deep neural networks is pretty straightforward. Uh, moving forward, what I want to do is kind of cut down on the amount of coefficients I calculate, because calculating 45 complex coefficients like this on a CPU is uh, pretty tough. Um, and so what we can do is identify which coefficients are the most important to our classification decisions. And in the past, in, in previous literature, that's kind of what people were doing. They were taking you know, the second moment and the fourth moment to help differentiate BPSK from QPSK. And so there's a history there, and basically bringing it back to these computationally efficient manners would be very great. And then finally, um, I've mentioned this a few times already, all of this modulation recognition happens after the receiver, after timing, frequency, and phase synchronization, which is a really hard thing to do if you don't know what the signal is, right? And so uh, investigating how to bring that back before your match filter, before your synchronization, uh, is kind of the next thing to do. And so here are a couple references. There's more in the technical proceedings, but uh, I think that's it for me right now. All right. Awesome. <laughs> well, there's not much that gets me excited, like nonlinear decision regions. Yeah. So are there any, uh, are there any questions from the audience? All right, we got one from Matt, one from Richard, it looks like. Um, so that was awesome. I, hey, think just need, I just think you need to hear that. Uh, but my one question is, um, or one of my many questions, but uh -huh. the most important one is, what's the gain in this method over using like ML? Um, that's a great question. I think uh, uh, my plan for moving forward uh, for pulling out the, uh, uh, um, pulling this method out before the receiver um, is that I'm hoping that the statistics captured by these moments, uh, along with some more machine learning stuff, will be able to uh, perform as well as ma uh, maximum likelihood in those cases. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, does, uh, does I had a hammer of orthogonal polynomials, and I just kind of nailed it into this thing. So, <laughs> does, yeah. does, uh, does maximum likelihood require like, phase synchronization and all that, the same stuff as what you did here? Yeah, so I'm not too smart on maximum likelihood when you don't know phase offset, for example. So there's, there's, you have to do a lot of estimation on these nuisance parameters, and so there's going to be some uh, interesting things going on there. Cool, thanks. All right. Um, I think, yeah, these discussions go on for a while, so I'd like to get uh, Richard a mic, Bob's up next, and then I think we'll have to continue afterwards. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't live in the AMC domain, so this might be very naive of me, but how, how far along are we with applying this real-time 
in the real world? How well does this really work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know that it works, but that's just an anecdote, right? Um, I think what I want to do is really clean up my code, and hopefully at some point maybe I can release it, um, and we can run this live. Uh, the classification uh, doesn't really take too much computation, but the training, you know, I'd set my computer up, hit go, go to work, come back, something crashed, so continue the computations. And so training is, is definitely a big part of uh, the considerations there. Uh, but yeah, for live stuff, there's, there's more investigation to see how well this works on the air. Uh-oh. Uh, no, I'm just going to, as usual, I'm going to make a comment. So uh, make Derek uh, came along, and uh, many of you who've known me talk about uh, neural networks for a long time know that I despise ad hocery because I'm a mathematician. What, uh, you saw the likelihood ratios in uh, some of his work. If you have a prior probability, the likelihood ratio is the radon nicotine derivative. And in this method that he's done, because of the way he's done it, for the first time, we're going to be able to compute career row bounds on the performance of these uh, uh, deep neural networks and have an underlying mathematical foundational principles for it, my, the first time that we can compute around. So uh, it's not perfect. We have more work to do, but that's his first step. So m as a mathematician trying to do machine intelligence, I'm having, give it firm theoretical foundations, this is a first step. Right, let's thank Derek. Awesome. All right, next up is Mark. While he's getting his laptop connected, just a few. Also, I do want to highlight again that uh, Derek's work is published in the technical proceedings of the conference, and there's a lot more detail there. So if you're interested in reading up uh, his academic paper on that, please, pubs.greenradio.org. So while, while Mark's still getting set up, I'll throw another question at you. Uh, so have you checked out the AMC work done as part of GSOC by Chris Richardson? Uh, presented on the poster over there. Can somebody get Derek a mic so he can respond? And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how your work could relate to that or how you might be able to incorporate the novel research that you've done into uh, the GR signals, um, signals intelligence, really. Um, yeah, so I, I briefly saw the poster. I didn't look into the, the specifics, but if I remember correctly, um, that method was kind of based on work that Tim O'Shea did. Uh, with some add-on cyclic uh, spectral correlation function things going on. Um, to to kind of talk about my work in, 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 where, in relation to Tim's work, I think Tim is doing a lot of work to do this blind automatic feature extraction kind of stuff. And I'm working from the angle of, of taking these expert features, uh, really understanding what's going on, and then moving towards that. And we're going to meet in the middle somewhere. Um, I think the work on the poster was, was great. Um, adding all of these features to these deep neural networks is going to make it more powerful. Um, was that the question? Did I answer the question? I, don't know. I, th I think that's <laughs> the perfect answer. Also, um, the, the project that that's a part of, uh, which is part, uh, was part of Sebastian Mueller's GSOC project, and Sebastian is actually here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it might be worth all getting together and chatting about where, what we're, where we could take this. Yeah. I, s I saw those posters. They're, they're pretty good looking. So go check them out if you haven't seen them. Awesome.